of our lecture on World War II. Uh, when we talked before, we were talking about everything leading up to the war, and now we're gonna see what happens when the US enters the war. So I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen with you so we can get started. Let me get this on here and play from current slide. All right, so when we talk about the US entering World War II, let me take a step back real quick because I wanna do a little bit of review and, and just touch on some of the stuff we might have missed last time. Um, first of all, let's look at where Europe is. Europe by 1941 is definitely under control of the Axis powers. You can see the uh, advancement that from Germany that uh, Hitler has made into France and you know we have Italy, Romania, Serbia, Croatia, all these countries are now under the occupation of Germany and the Axis powers. So that's what's going on there. Meanwhile, in the United States, we're still trying to maintain our neutrality. Now, we know that the United States as a whole, the majority of the American people want to stay completely out of this war. And we looked at that graphic from the New York Times when it said what's on most people's minds in 1941 is for America to stay out of the war. However, we also see the need to go in and help our allies where we can. And this is where uh, FDR's arsenal of democracy is going to come into play. And one of the biggest parts of that is the Lend-Lease Act, in which we're going to basically lend or lease military equipment to allied powers. Now, it starts with England, but we're also going to send uh, supplies and armaments to the Soviet Union and to China and other ally countries, because that's who we're trying to help. Now, this is completely different than what we did at the beginning of World War I. If you look back at the start, <clears throat> excuse me, at the start of World War I, we were selling, you know, supplies and weapons to both sides. Now that's going to streamline into just supporting the allies, but initially, you know, we are playing both sides of the coin. Not the case here. We are definitely supporting the allied powers. Now, one thing that we should point out also is even though we weren't in the war, we are going to protect our trade interests. And in doing so, we're going to set up what's known as the Allied Convoy System. And the Allied Convoy System, basically, we're going to use the American Naval Fleet to protect English ships as they take goods from America to England. Now, that's, they're, they're taking it on the cash and carry system or, you know, also through the Lend-Lease program. Now, the reason why we can say we can, you know, follow them and set up this convoy, those are our goods going across the ocean. And so we're going to send out ships, we're going to send out planes, and their job is to seek out any German subs or German uh, naval vessels. And our ships had the authority to shoot on site. So again, we're not involved in the war yet, but we are definitely involved in supporting the Allied powers, specifically England. Also in 1941, we're gonna see when the Battle of Britain does not result in England surrendering to Germany, Hitler's going to shift his view back to the East and to the Soviet Union. And he's gonna completely break the non-aggression pact that he had signed with Stalin, and he is going to attack the Soviet Union. And you can see by this, this graphic here, how far the German troops actually got into the Soviet Union, like 20 miles away from Moscow. And the Soviets, though, are going to have the blessing of winter come in, and then they're going to be able to stop, start pushing the Germans back. Because once winter set in, it was very difficult to maintain the supply lines that Germany had set up. Because remember, the Soviets were using that scorched earth policy as they you know, retreated, meaning they were destroying anything the Germans could have used for supplies or to advance their cause in the Soviet Union. So the further that Germany gets into the Soviet Union, the further they get away from Berlin and their supply hub. So once winter sets in, it's very difficult to get supplies into the Soviet Union, which is going to stop the progression of the German troops and allow the Soviets to slowly start pushing them back. And over the next three years, we're gonna see the Soviets push the Germans all the way back to Berlin, where we'll actually see the Soviets occupy Berlin. Um, 1941, August, you're going to see the Atlantic Charter. Again, we're not in the war, but FDR is going to meet with um, Winston Churchill, who is now the Prime Minister of England. Neville Chamberlain is gone. 
And at this, at this meeting, which is going to take place on a U.S. warship, they're going to discuss what Europe is going to look like after the war. So they're really planning ahead here. And when they came together, these were the key ideas that they came away with. This war is not about territorial gains. We're not trying to grow our country. Um, every country, every person in Europe should have the right to self-determination. Self-determination meaning they can choose what type of government they want. Trade barriers between countries in the world are gonna be lowered, making it easier to trade, building a global economy again. And then they talked about the freedom of want and fear. Now this is building off of what is known as the four freedoms that FDR is gonna talk about to the American people. And this drawing created by Norman Rockwell uh, illustrates these four freedoms. And they are the freedom of speech, the freedom of worship, the freedom from want, and the freedom from fear. Now, in the United States, we already had the freedom of speech and the freedom of worship. That is guaranteed to us through the First Amendment of the Constitution. Um, with, with the idea of the freedom of want and the freedom of fear, uh, Roosevelt and Churchill believe that that should be universal. So that's also going to be a, I guess, a foundation coming out of World War II. Freedom of the seas, we've heard this argument before. In fact, we've talked about freedom of the seas going all the way back to the War of 1812. Neutral powers and countries having the right to traverse the oceans and the waterways of the world in order to, to trade and, and build their economies. And that's the same here. They want freedom of the seas for everyone. Uh, disarmament of aggressor nations. And then also the plan for a new collective security organization. This is the basis for the United Nations. Now, when you look at this list, some of it or a lot of it should seem familiar because a lot of it sounds very familiar or very similar to Woodrow Wilson's 14 points that he introduced following World War I at the Treaty of Versailles uh, discussions. So these ideas are continuing on. They didn't die with Wilson and they didn't die with the fact that the United States didn't join the League of Nations. Okay. Meanwhile, the Japanese empire is starting to grow. We know in 1932 that Japan invaded Manchuria and the United States is going to issue the Stimson Doctrine saying that we're not gonna recognize any government that's been put in place by a belligerent power. Um, this was, I, I, like another, I think it, you know, it wasn't very powerful. It was more, I think sometimes more talk than action. But as we see the Japanese empire expand, the United States is going to take further action. And that action is going to incur, uh, include excuse me, an embargo on all exports to Japan. And as you remember, an embargo is a halt of trade. So we are stopping all exports that go to Japan, and that includes oil. Now remember, Japan is a natural resource short country. That's why they started expansion. They were looking for natural resources. They depend on a lot from the United States, oil being one of them. So us cutting off oil... I believe at the time that only gave them like six months of reserves in, in petroleum that they had that they could go off of until they were going to be completely out. We also froze all the Japanese assets in U.S. banks. Uh, at this point, foreign countries were putting their money in American banks, and we froze the accounts of the Japanese, and that means they can't get to their money. And finally, we're also sending supplies through the Lend-Lease program to China to help them defend themselves against Japan. Now, when you look at these actions taken by the U.S. government, these are specific reasons why Japan was looking towards uh, launching an attack against the United States. They had to do something. And so they, they started planning their attack of Pearl Harbor during this time period. Now, Interestingly, three days before the Japanese attacked Pearl Harbor, the Chicago Daily Tribune is going to light a fire of, of information because someone breaks this story that Franklin Delano Roosevelt had already started planning the U.S. entry into the war in Europe, you know, and possibly a war in Asia. And in the quotes, he was, the, the writer was saying that what they found was the blueprint for total war on a scale unprecedented in at least two oceans, three continents, Europe, Africa, and Asia. Bottom line, FDR was planning on entering into this world war 
1943. And he was, had this plan to build our military, to train our military, to get the munitions we needed. So what we could do is we could launch total war alongside the allies, not only in Europe, but in North Africa and Asia as well. And it was going to be this, this concentrated effort. And this story breaks three days before Pearl Harbor. Now, this didn't really have any effect on the Pearl Harbor attack. It didn't play into it, I don't believe, because that attack had been planned months earlier. But as an American citizen, you read this knowing that we really want to stay out of this war, and then we find out our president's been planning to go to war. You can kind of understand why Americans might be concerned at this time. But Three days later, December 7th, 1941, a date you have got to know, December 7th, 1941, Japan attacks Pearl Harbor. <clears throat> now, this was a surprise attack. However, it wasn't as surprising as you might think. It was also the goal of the Japanese to completely wipe out our, our Pacific fleet. It was a devastating attack, but it wasn't as devastating as you might think. Uh, this is an actual picture from the attack. There's a, a Japanese plane right there with a circle around it. When we say it was a surprise attack, we had the understanding or we had the belief that Japan was going to attack us. Several things had led to that. Obviously, the relationship between us and their country. Also, we had intercepted messages between the Japanese government and their foreign officials in Washington, D.C., telling them to cut off all talks with US officials, that should have been a key right there. So the, the fact that Japan attacked us was not a surprise. What was a surprise was where they attacked us. We, you know, Pearl Harbor was seen as a possible target, but it was seen as unlikely because of the distance from Japan. We expected maybe attack on Guam or Midway or, or someplace like that, but not Pearl Harbor. We also thought Pearl Harbor would be safe because of the structure of the harbor. See, Pearl Harbor is a shallow harbor. The, the depth of the water is not as deep as most other naval ports. And this can be a tactical advantage from our side because, you know, here's your quick introduction to torpedo warfare. Torpedoes, as they come down, here's a torpedo coming down, that's my pin. As they come down, once they're in the water, they level off and then they're propelled through the water until they hit their target. Well, with a shallow port, Torpedoes don't, they, they didn't have the way to, to gauge how deep they were. So they thought with the shallow port that this torpedo warfare would not work in Pearl Harbor because it was too shallow and these torpedoes would just drop or sink to the bottom. Well, what the Japanese did was they built these fins that they put on the back of the, um, the torpedoes to, to build up their buoyancy. And they, you know, there was just a two pieces of wood kind of crossed like that, and you know, or something like that. I don't know if that's, a, you know, completely accurate, but this is my my video version. And they attached these fins to these torpedoes so that when they when the torpedo came into the water, instead of going to a depth that they couldn't be ineffective, they're going to start turning at a more at a at a more shallow depth. That way, they're going to be able to hit the broadside of ships, and that's what's going to cause a lot of damage to these ships. Now, it's not just going to be the harbor that's attacked, the airfield, Hickam Airfield is gonna be attacked as well. Now, how did they get away with it? How were they able to surprise us? Well, one thing was the entire fleet, the entire Japanese fleet moved over here under the cover of clouds and storms. So we weren't, our radar wasn't sophisticated enough to pick them up as clearly as we would hope. And then speaking of radar, there were radar stations all over the island of Oahu. However, these were new stations, um, the, the operation of them, we weren't real clear how that worked. We had three towers. Two of them were actually shut down so the sailors could go to breakfast that morning. And we actually saw the planes coming in on the radar. But we also knew that we were expecting, I think, some B-52 bombers that were going to come in from San Francisco that day. So when we see this hazy blip coming on the screen, it was just assumed it was the bombers that were expected. So it was kind of just pushed inside saying, no big deal. They also got the surprise attack because they attacked on a Sunday morning. And most people are asleep at that time. And so they're not, you know, not, you know the, the, the sailors aren't up and moving around because it's typically a day off. Now, it could have been so much worse. Um, it was pretty devastating what happened. Uh, three waves of attacks were planned on Pearl Harbor. 
The first two waves are going to damage a number of ships. They're going to sink two ships. We are going to lose the USS Oklahoma, and we're going to lose the USS Arizona. They are going to be sunk to the, to the bottom of the harbor, and they are not going to be recoverable. Um, the Arizona, if you go to Oahu today, if you go to Pearl Harbor, you can take a boat out to this memorial and where you can stand above and you can look down and see the Arizona beneath the surface. Uh, they, they chose not to raise it. In fact, they also chose that the men who perished on that ship when it sunk, they are still there in the ship. And out of respect, they have left them there. But like I said, two, three waves were planned. Only two waves actually came through. So this could have been so much worse than it was. I mean, we, we're talking about, the, a lot of people said the third wave, had that come in, um, that could have actually devastated our fleet completely but it didn't come in. They called it off for whatever reason at the last minute. And so most of the ships that were damaged, we were able to rebuild. Um, there was one ship that kind of listed to the side and it was, there was concern that it might've blocked off the entry into the harbor, but instead of falling this way, it went this way and that kept the harbor open. Um, what else? I mean, other things are, are, none of our aircraft carriers were in the harbor at the time. All of our aircraft carriers were out to sea. So there were things that did go our way. And while the Japanese inflicted a lot of damage and over 2,000 men were killed, it wasn't enough to bury the fleet. In fact, we were able to come back stronger from that. Um, the next day, December 8th, 1941, Franklin Delano Roosevelt is going to go to the Congress and he's going to ask for a declaration of war. And this is when he's gonna give his speech that says December 7th, 1941, a day which will live in infamy. Uh, interestingly, when he originally wrote the speech, he said, December 7th, 1941, a day that's gonna live in world history. Just doesn't have the same feel to it. So what's become one of the most famous speeches in FDR's presidency could have been not quite as succinct, not quite as strong, but to that one word, infamy, just changes the whole tone of it. Congress does declare war and um, immediately we start planning. And when once we declare war on Japan, Germany, part of the Tripartite Act, is gonna declare war on us as well as Italy. And the United States officially adjoins the alliance, the allied powers of Great Britain and the Soviet Union. France, not much use to us. They're still occupied by Germany, but they're still considered an allied power.